Good morning, brother. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I see we have a beautiful day for this last day of 11 breath. Oh, yeah. And everybody's in good spirits. My message today ties with the message I gave two weeks ago. Uh, the first. Um, before the, the, the days of unleavened bread started, I uh, gave a message entitled, As the Spring Holy Days Approach. This is like a follow up. This one is called, As the Spring Holy Days End. And the SPS tells us that the work must go on. I mentioned in that message how we prepare for the season that we were having, the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, how we should prepare, how we should spend them. And I think we did that, brethren, and I think, I hope we all did it from the bottom of our hearts with the love and respect that we should have done it with. With all our hearts and minds. <clears throat> and now we have come to the last day of unleavened bread. And as much as a celebration means to us, we had a good time. We went through that season. We were saddened by the fact that our Lord had to suffer and die for us. But we were, we, we were made very happy by the fact that by his sufferings, he paved the way for us, he prepared us for a life, an everlasting life of goodness and peace and love with himself and the Father. So he overcame death and sin when he rose again. And he did this to save the entire world. And we are thankful. We are happy. The book of John, chapter 19 and verse 28 through 30, tells us. And this is after Jesus had gone through all his suffering, all his pain, and he had come to the very end. He said, the word says, after this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. What did he mean, it is finished? The work that he had come to do was complete. He had done it and he had done it very well and to the satisfaction of his father. And that pleased him, even though he was suffering, even though he was dying, giving up the ghost. He was pleased to say, it is finished. I've done what I came to do. We know that in his suffering, he prepared a firm and secure place for us. In his father's house, no less. In his father's house, which no one can ever take away from us. We have been blessed in that way. In John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 3, he said to his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many, men, uh, are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. He was assuring us as he went along, assuring us as he went along. And this was before his death. In Romans, the third chapter, and verses 22 through 25, the word tells us the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Christ redeems us. God presented him as, a, as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. All the sins that mankind has committed over the time that man existed, it took God, the life of a God, to come and release us from all that, make us clean again, and able to go on and do the things that our Lord has given us to do. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, 17 through 19, also tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Didn't I say in the last message, it was a new beginning? It's a new beginning for us and for every other believer. And we're moving forward. We're moving forward. We're not giving up. 18 says, everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So see what Christ did here now. He reconciled us to himself and to our Father God, and then he passed on the ministry to us to reconcile ourselves both to them and to everyone else, to bring everyone else in that we are able to. The ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. He has given us. During this time, there was a meeting of many brethren that we had not seen for months. And that was also a very nice time, a very pleasant thing. <clears throat> and it was something that uh, I'm sure that we all enjoyed because we all had someone that we hadn't seen and was, was happy and glad to see again. We enjoy that. And we all look forward to combined services for that reason. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and verses 23 through 25 tell us, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. We can't do that if we didn't see each other, meet together during those days. In many cases, embrace each other and show that appreciation and love that we feel for each other. So we look forward to that, to those days, those meetings, those very special times. So we want to provoke love and good works between ourselves. We want this to grow. 
we want to just follow up on that work that the Lord had done over all that time and continue to make it better. Not neglecting the gathering together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as we see the day approaching. And sometimes we may not see the day approaching because our short lives seem so long to us. It seems like we have so much. Today we have people living uh, to 100 years old and more. I know a lady right now, she's 107. On her last birthday, she was 107. And uh, that seems like such a long time to us. You know, we can't even remember way back. But it's a drop in the bucket for the end time. The end time started a couple thousand years ago. And still it's like, it's like nothing to God. It's like a drop in the bucket to the Lord. So the day is approaching. It's happening. And when it does come, God has it set up in such a way that it could begin and end before we really realize what's happening. So we have to be constantly on the alert, constantly looking out, and constantly working to make it better. So we must be glad to meet together and encourage and love each other. But although this day is the end of this celebration, this present season, life must go on. Life must go on. And our God gave us the ability to do this, go on with life, without having doubt, and without wondering, what's next? Without thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's such a long time before the next day. So, the message is called, as the spring holidays end. But although this special season is ended, let's remember that there are better days ahead. Much better days ahead. Our Lord has promised us. <coughs> so these days are ending. What do we do? Do we fold our arms and walk away? No. No. We have to go back to life as usual. Because the priesthood and our kingship is not yet here. We still have to wait for that. We still have to work. We still have to wait. And sometimes it, it, it may be hard. It, it, our, our spirits may, may, may fall and we may become sad. We may feel sometimes like David said in Psalm 13, How long, O oh Lord? How long? But, brethren, instead of expressing the feelings of verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 13, which are, David says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me? Agony in my mind every day. How long will my enemy dominate me? That was how he began. But we know the kind of man David was. He never really gave up hope. He always, he always trusted in the Lord. And he always uh, followed what the Lord told him, even when he suffered. So instead of those two verses, let's go to verses 5 and 6 and see the real David. The real David. He says, but I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. He knows what the Lord has to offer and what the Lord will offer. And he believes in it and he's stating it. Verse 6 says, I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me generously. Whatever happened in his life, whatever happened in his life, he knew that the Lord was treating him generously. He knew that he had done things that <coughs> wasn't very good. And he was willing and ready to acknowledge this and show his respect and his love and his trust in God. 
so we can't feel too badly or feel like it's all over. Or it's too long to wait. No, it's not. Because during that time, we have work to do. We have work to do. We don't have to be sad about those times. <clears throat> it's tough, but we don't have to be sad. Because our Lord has set up his system in such a way that we always have a positive road to follow. There's never a time we don't have a positive road to follow as far as the work of God <coughs> is concerned. 1 Corinthians 10 Verses 9 through 13 tells us. Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. And of course, the word is talking here about the Israelites. And don't grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroyer. Whenever believers behave that way and refuse to bend and turn away and, and, and give up that type of behavior, there's chastening to come. The Lord would correct us. And sometimes the correction could be quite serious, quite strong. So... <clears throat> Some of them were destroyed by snakes, and others who grumbled were killed by the destroyer. And these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction on whom the end of the ages have come. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. Sometimes we think, oh, I got this. I've got it together. We're not that strong. And we're never so big, never so strong, never so mighty that we don't need God to turn back to him and ask him, Father, be with me. I try to do it every day. Be with me, Lord. Help me to get through this. And verse 13 says, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. God doesn't give us more than we can handle. We can always take care of it either by the strength that he puts in us or the strength that we may turn and ask him to give to us. We can always get through it. Now we know about the many celebrations that take place in our society. So many of them. If we had a day off for every holiday, we'd probably have an extra month. <laughs> an extra month. <clears throat> there are 39 days listed in our calendar, the calendars that we use every day. 39 days of holidays. Mm. If every business gave people uh, you know, one of those days, not one of those days, but all of those days, they'd be, uh, you know, constantly hiring new people because they never have enough to do the work. But there are only a few of God's holy days included in those 39 days. God, when we, when we total God's holy days that he has, he has, uh, given us to keep the total 19, 19 days. The Passover, one day. Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days. Feast of Pentecost, one day. Feast of Trumpets, one day. Day of Atonement, one day. Feast of Tabernacles, seven days. The last great day, one day. Total of 19. Now a few of our Holy days are listed in the 39 days that's in the calendar, but not many of them. Not many of them. And those few 
only believers keep. So we're talking about the entire world. Just a few believers are keeping the days that, that, that are listed in our calendar. In the meantime, God has given us a calendar to follow. God has given us the days. And if we keep the days that God gives us, we don't have time for any of the others. We'll have to work really hard to do what God tells us and do that at the same time. And some of them we can't compete with. Can we compete with Christmas and Easter? Oh boy. That's big time, big time. Fortunately, we live by what God gave us to live by. God gives us. We know it always works. We know it makes sense. We know that it's an order. One thing follows the next, showing us where we're going, what it's all about. And we know that when we are pleasing to God, He blesses us tremendously. Let's look at Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. And this is a little long, but it tells, it tells what the Lord is asking us to do, what he expects of us. And he's showing us what results and blessings we will have by doing it. Verse 1 says, Now if you faithfully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all his commands I am giving you today, the Lord your God will put you far above the nations of the earth. Now we are, we are being shown here, we are being shown here what happens when we please the Lord and obey him. All these blessings will come and overtake you because you obey the Lord of God. Do what the Lord tells you, you'll be blessed. You'll reap a good harvest. This is what it's saying. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. And we know, of course, that the Lord is talking here to his people Israel, whom he devoted so much time and love on, even when they were being punished. Your offspring will be blessed and your lands produce and the offspring of your livestock, including the young of your herds and the newborn of your flocks. Your basket and kneading bowl will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will cause the enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will march out against you from one direction, but flee from you in seven directions. And this is all history. All history. The Lord showed Israel these things. The Lord showed Israel what happened when they were obedient and what happened when they did their own thing, followed their own way. The Lord will grant you a blessing on your bonds and on everything you do. He will bless you in the land the Lord your God has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people. As he swore to you, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. The Lord proved it over and over. And each time Israel did the right thing, they were blessed. Each time they did their own thing, they suffered. Then all the peoples of the earth will see you, that you bear the Lord's name, and they will stand in awe of you. The Lord will make you prosper abundantly with offspring, the offspring of your livestock and your land's produce in the land the Lord swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open for you his abundant storehouse, the sky, to give your land rain in the season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend it to many. 
nations, but you will not borrow. You will be self-sufficient. You will be able to give. You will be able to control. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Sometimes we wonder about that. You will only move upward and never downward if you listen to the Lord your God's commands. I am giving you today and you are careful to follow them. Be careful to follow them. Do not turn aside to the right nor to the left from the things I am commanding you and do not follow other gods to worship them. These were the instructions. These were the things that the Lord told Israel to do. And he told Israel what the results, the blessings will be if they did it. There are other scriptures will, which, which explain to Israel, if you don't do it, this is what I'll do. Just the opposite. And it went to the extreme of, I will, do, I will scatter you among the nations. I will scatter you among the nations. And over and over, they did not obey. And that's what happened eventually. That's what happened eventually. So we remember those words of the Lord. Remember they are true for us today as they were for the Israelites. Remember that the Lord gave his life for us. He did it that we can be blessed and saved. It was a very serious thing. He made, he made his people and he is creating a system in which everyone will be blessed and happy and live a good life. There will be no more evil, no more, no more nasty behavior. So he wants us all to be blessed and saved. We can't afford to be stubborn and stiff-necked like the children of Israel was. We have to remember that the Lord died for this. He died that we might live. So as the days of unleavened bread end, we don't stop working. We go on working. We go on doing the things that we, uh, we know we should be doing. The work must go on. And even more vehemently, it must go on with God's people. With God's people. He didn't leave us stranded. That we don't know where to turn next. He gave us a plan and a format that we can see and understand. One phase of, God, of God's work always leads to the next step. And it builds, it gets better each time. And it gets very serious in the end. For all those who do not do what we have been called to do. His plan makes sense. Uh, it, he, he always shows us where it's leading. So, at this stage, at the end of, the, of this season, he tells us the next step, the next holy day, to find out when that is, we count 50. We count 50. And we have counted 50, we know when the next day is. And during that time, we must prepare ourselves, just like we prepared ourselves for the Passover and the Holy Days, we prepare ourselves for the next step in the plan of God, the next season, the day of Pentecost. The law tells us in Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23, verses 4 through 8. He says, These are the Lord's appointed times, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Passover, that the Lord comes the first month, at twilight on the 14th day of the month. The festival of unleavened bread to the Lord is the 15th day of the same month. For seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you are to hold a sacred assembly. You are not to do any daily work. 
you are to present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day, there will be a sacred assembly. Do not do any work. So we have come to that day. <clears throat> and this was a time of renewing, a time of the new beginning. A time of preparing for something bigger and better. As the plan of God's new system progresses, the new system that we're waiting for so patiently, the, the new system that we'll enjoy so much when it comes. We'll enjoy it so much when it comes. Leviticus 23, verses 14 through 16 tells us, you must not eat bread, roasted grain, or any new grain until this very day, and until you have brought the offering to your God. This is a permanent statute throughout your generations, wherever you live. You are to count seven complete weeks, starting from the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the presentation offering. You are to count 50 days until the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. And we know that today we don't, we don't give offerings of animals and food, burnt offerings and drink offerings anymore. Uh, we haven't since the death of Christ. But we give what the Lord gives us. We give what the Lord gives us, uh, and it comes from our heart, we get the things that we can afford and what we think is proper. So as we prepare for Passover and unleavened bread, we now prepare for Pentecost, which is next in line. During these present feast days, we have been strengthened and prepared to travel the next stretch of the road, which would take us to the Feast of Pentecost. I think we have, we have been strengthened enough, and we can always ask for more strength as we go along, because we want to know that as the new day approaches, we are prepared to meet it and to do the things that we're supposed to do then. So by doing that, we must now, in doing that, we must now prepare ourselves by doing similar things like we did for the, for the, for the Passover. Praying and, and, and uh, turning to God for the help we need and trying to keep strong so that we might get there in one piece, with the right mind, doing everything that God appointed us to do. We must remember we have been given the strength and the ability to walk the straight line. We have been given that strength. And we must muster it up, pull it up, and do it. Let's not say, well, you know, this feast is over. We don't need to do anything more until the next one comes. No, the point is, and the reason we're given these days to be kept throughout the year is that one feast would strengthen us for the next one to come. And we must do that work. We must do that praying. We must do that, that, that uh, you know, um, making that effort to do God's will and to do it well. We must do it with cheerfulness and confidence. And if we live to make it there, if we get to that point that we make it to the next feast day, let's do it with cheerfulness, with zeal, and with a true heart. <clears throat> 